apologetics is simply the defense and the communication and the demonstration of the Christian uh, worldview. This is derived in large part from 1 Peter 3.15, which exhorts us to, always, to, to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts, always being ready to give a reasoned defense for the hope that is within us, but to do it with gentleness and respect. A lot of people remember the first part, but they don't remember the second part. Gentleness and respect. Our tone and our posture always matters when we're uh, representing uh, Christ. But oftentimes with apologetics, there's this overemphasis. There's an overemphasis on the mind to the subordination of the heart. Now, perhaps you hear things like, especially in our culture today, you hear facts over feelings, right? How many of you have you heard that before? Facts over feelings. Or perhaps you heard something like, we can't let our feelings dictate our actions. And these are all things that are true. But we also have to remember that God created us with, as beings with feelings, with emotions. Emotions and feelings are replete all throughout the Bible. If you read the, the prophets, for example, they're constantly expressing different types of feelings uh, depending upon what's going on in their cultural setting. If you read the Psalms, all types of emotions. There's happiness, there's joy, there's frustration, there's sadness, there's loneliness. Many of the feelings that we feel, many of the feelings that have come with the uncertainty of 2020 are things that the psalmist have expressed. And God himself, Christ, has expressed feelings. I talked about this and I mentioned this in the first part of my talk. But again, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. This was a verse dealing with emotions, dealing with feelings. So while it's certainly true that we should not subordinate or, or, or our feelings shouldn't act as the compass for everything that we do, we certainly shouldn't push it aside as if feelings and emotions aren't, uh, aren't important as well. With that being said, reason, reason is incredibly important to the Christian faith. And it's oftentimes what separates our faith from other worldviews and other, uh, other religions. You think about, for example, in Isaiah. Isaiah says, come, let us reason together. This is judicial language that the Lord is using. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though your sins are red as crimson, I will make them like wool. So God is saying, come on, let's, let's talk about these things together. Let's reason together and, and go over these things. So as I begin to work on this second talk, I was trying to think, okay, what would be the best way to approach this in a setting like this? Should I sort of just stick to one apologetic method and talk for 40 minutes about that? That might be kind of boring. So I, I said, let's not do that. But I thought about the fact that you're going to have people here of all different age groups, of different backgrounds, perhaps coming from different cities with different contexts and cultures that they're dealing with. So I thought about a way to talk about apologetics that hopefully will speak to everyone in here. Maybe some of you uh, will be more inclined to certain parts of the talk. Maybe others will be inclined to other parts of the talk. But hopefully, hopefully, everyone will leave feeling somewhat equipped to engage in defending your faith. So when I graduated from Michigan State um, back in, uh, was it 2005, um, I, I went on to join a, um, what's an institute, it's called the Sports Journalism Institute. And they chose 12 students from across the nation to participate in what was kind of like a journal.
University of Iowa or University of Northern Iowa or Drake uh, football or Drake track, all these different uh, wonderful universities that come from Iowa. It was this part of my experience that had to do with more of the concrete application. So that's how I want to sort of parse my talk today. I want to deal sort of with the abstract up front. And perhaps some of you more be, more, may, may be more inclined to the abstract philosophical or reasoning parts of apologetics. And then the latter part is going to deal more with the concrete application, more of the relational story narrative aspects of apologetics. So speaking of the abstract, there's these three standard apologetic methodologies. Now there's many more, but these are sort of the three standard ones. There's classical, evidential, and presuppositional. Now classical literally gets its name, it's, it's derived from the fact that many Christians from antiquity, uh, like a, a, a Augustine and so many others, they use this type of me methodology when they would talk about and they would defend the faith. So it utilizes natural theology, the things around us in our world, the natural things in our world, to establish theism as the correct worldview. It utilizes natural theology to establish theism as the correct worldview. And essentially it does that in two steps. The first step is that it, it seeks to prove the existence of God through traditional proofs. And then one would try to prove the veracity of Christianity by showing the truthfulness of a particular claim. So let me show you what that looks like. Again, the first part is that you're trying to seek to prove the existence of God through traditional proofs, natural theology. So there's an argument, some of you might be familiar with it, it's called the cosmological argument or the Kalam cosmological argument. And it's, it's cos co it just deals with cosmo uh, cosmology. And so it goes like this. Everything that begins to exist, everything in this world that begins to exist has a cause. That's the first premise. The second premise is the universe Science tells us, and I won't go into all the details now, but if you look into science, and scientists don't disagree upon this point for the most part, uh, the universe had a beginning. Therefore, they lead to the conclusion the universe, excuse, yeah, the universe uh, began, uh, excuse me, the universe had a cause. So the next appropriate question is then, what is that cause? What would then comprise a cause that would be something that would be, have to be powerful enough to create a universe? That would have to be a personal type of agent to create personal beings like yourself and myself. Something that was outside of time to create something in time. When you think about these factors and many more that I won't get into right now, these, uh, these identify what we come to know as God. Now, an argument like this doesn't establish the Christian God. I want to be clear about that. It just establishes that God must exist. And for a lot of people, like atheists or agnostics, for example, you can't jump sh straight from uh, talking about these things to talking about Christ. You need to establish they won't believe in Christ if they don't believe uh, in God in the first place. So you need to kind of take them along uh, this track. And then the second part deals with proving the veracity of Christianity. Uh, so you can do this by talking about the evidence for the resurrection. I'll get more into that in a minute. Or the reliability of the Bible. People, a lot of people have questions about, is the Bible actually reliable? There's, I've heard that there's, people will say, I've heard that there's thousands and thousands of variants throughout the Bible. How can it be reliable if there's all of these scribal mistakes? And so those are things that we deal with. So you can talk about those. So the second one is the evidential. Now, what distinguishes the classical from the evidential is the fact that you're moving straight. Oftentimes, people who utilize this move straight to the evidences. And they do this because they don't want to get bogged down oftentimes in philosophical arguments and objections. So this will be people like the uh, New, New Testament scholars, Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona, who have written extensively on things like the resurrection Gary Habermas was also a graduate of Michigan State. I gotta throw that out there. And then uh, also Josh McDowell, perhaps you've heard of, of him before. He has his uh, treatise that a lot of people know, the, the new evidence that demands a verdict. But for the evidentialists, again, they would, they would go straight to these evidences. So perhaps you're talking to someone about the evidences for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, 
Uh, Gary Habermas has coined a term, a phrase called minimal facts, the minimal facts theory. And this theory essentially states that there's a minimal facts that all scholars, it doesn't matter if one is a Christian scholar, it doesn't matter if one is an atheist or whatever background one has, all scholars agree, or, or most scholars agree on these minimal facts concerning the resurrection narrative. So for example, things like the fact that Jesus Christ actually died of Roman crucifixion. That's a pretty undisputed fact by scholars. The fact that he was really, really buried in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. The fact that, um, that a lot of people, uh, 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 after he, as he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, after he was raised, people said that they really, they thought that they really saw the risen Christ. Another undispute, really undisputable claim. And also the fact that uh, after this happened, uh, um, that there were some skeptics that actually converted to Christianity because they, they thought that they perceived the real risen Christ. So there's other parts of the resurrection narrative. But again, these are the minimal facts that Gary Habermas has pointed out that all scholars agree on. And he says that even with these minimal facts, you can establish the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in history. Now he goes through much more detail uh, than that, but that's sort of a starting point uh, for evidentialism. Finally, we have what's called presuppositional. Now I won't get too bogged down in this, but essentially, whereas the, the classical was heavily focused on reason and logic, presuppositionalists actually believe that people can't be reasoned into believing that God exists, that, th that this can't happen. They presuppose the truth of Christianity and say that the very et attempt at reasoning without Christianity being true is a futile exercise. So they might say something like this. If they're in conversation with an atheist who wants to talk about, well, you know, God, you know, I see all these passages about slavery in the Bible. God seems to condone slavery. Why in the world would I want to believe in a God who condones these evil actions? And so the presuppositionists might, instead of going straight to talking about the passages that deal with slavery in the Bible, they might say, well, listen, what you're talking about is uh, these concepts of a moral good and a moral wrong. But on an atheistic framework, where could you, on an atheistic worldview, where, where do you even get the, the reference points to adjudicate between what's good and evil? You see, on atheism, the presuppositionalists would say, on atheism, there's, uh, that worldview is built on subjectiv subject subjectivity and relativism, meaning that the truth of things are only dependent upon the person. So the objective standard, there's no objective standard. The standard is one's feelings. So what happens then if one person, if one person has feelings that slavery is a bad thing and another person has, has feelings that slavery is a good thing, who becomes the right one? Well, it's, it's not, there's no objective standard to say that one is good or wrong. It's just whoever can express their opinion in the strongest way or has the power, has the power to uh, uh, impose their thoughts or their feelings. I gave this example earlier, but if you think about, for example, the Holocaust. The Holocaust was an example of an extreme horror. I think we would all agree on that. But under atheism, and I'm not saying that atheism necessarily leads to, to uh, some, some horrific things like this, but what I'm saying is the moral compass that Hitler worked with to do the things that he did and start up the Nazi regime, regime and kill uh, millions of Jewish men, women, and children was built upon the fact that he thought this was a moral good and he had the power to enact it. On an atheistic worldview, there is no objective standard for that. So if you have more questions, we can talk about that uh, a little bit more in the Q&A, but hopefully, hopefully some of that uh, makes sense to you. So th that's sort of the abstract standard apologetic methodologies. Now I want to move more into the narrative. See, some people, some people are more abstract, again, or propositional learners, so they deal more with ideas and theories, reason, logic, philosophy. Others 
are more narrative or concrete relational learners. So they'll deal more with stories and examples, and they want to see they want to see how it works. They want to sort of get their their hands uh, in the dirt here, and that's part of the value of apologetics. The part of the value of apologetics is not only showing that Christianity is true, but that it's beautiful. Earlier, I mentioned these three uh, frameworks that Dr. Peter, Peter Crave talks about when dealing with Christianity. He says we must show that Christianity is not only true, but that it's true, it's beautiful, and it's good. All three of these things. So engaging the imagination of the listener allows you to share your faith in a more relatable matter at times. Now there's three ways in which you can do this. The first one is sort of from personal narratives. Can you all hear me okay? Make sure, okay. We got a little, <laughs> little distraction over there. <laughs> but it's, it's all good. As long as you can hear me okay, it works. So there's three different ways in which you can go about this narrative, okay? The first one, if you're more of a relational type of learner, or, 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 you, or you seek to express your, your faith in that way, there's three different types. The first one is a personal narrative. Perhaps if you're familiar with RZIM at all, you've heard the story of our beloved and now deceased Ravi Zacharias. He's talked a lot about his conversion came on a bed of suicide. Perhaps many of you have heard him say that before. And on his bed of suicide, he was given the Bible and it was open to the book of John chapter 14. And the specific verse that he read was because I live, you too shall live. So when he goes and speaks to crowds of tens of people or crowds of thousands of people, when he gives his personal narrative, there are people in the crowd that have dealt with various types of mental, Ill, uh, mental issues. They struggle with depression or suicide or many other things. And they find this so relatable for them. And, they talk, and he talks about how Christ made all of the difference for him and his state and how it helped in his conversion. So for many people, a personal narrative will reach their heart where logic won't necessarily reach their mind. And then you have non-biblical examples. So say for example, you're trying to explain God's love to someone, but you don't want to use sort of the, the Christian vernacular that a lot of people might not be familiar with. So again, you can use these non-biblical method, methods. So there's a philosopher his name is Soren Kierkegaard, and he has a book of different types of parables. And he gives us one parable, it's called A King in Disguise. And I'll just give you sort of a brief, um, a, be, a brief paraphrase of it. So there was this king, and he lived in a high uh, castle. And once in a while, he would go among, into, the, uh, into the land and talk to people and he would deal with the merchants and things like that. And one day on one of his trips, he looked out the window of his caravan and he saw this beautiful woman. Oh man, he couldn't take, he couldn't take his eyes off of her. He was so enchanted and enthralled by her beauty. And so he made it up in his mind at that point that he wanted her to love him. And so what he did was, he started to think of ways, how can I get her to love? Love me. He, he started to go through all these different ways, and one of the ways he thought about was, well, I am a king, so I could force her to come to the castle, and I could propose marriage that way. But he said, no, that wouldn't be a good way. I mean, if you're forcing someone, that's coercion. So that's not love, right? And so he said, no, I can't do that. So what he landed on, he said, what I'll do is, I'll take off all, take off all of my priestly attire. I'll go and live where she lives at. I'll get a more of a mundane job, like a carpenter. And I'll work, I'll work with, uh, within her community. And I'll do this in hopes that one day, one day, she will love me. Because it was me, it was me who loved her first. And maybe you see the Christian narrative throughout this parable. You see what Kierkegaard is trying to tell his, his listener is that God first loved us. And that he was, he, was in, he was with God, God the Father, in heaven. But he chose to divest himself of many of those divine attributes and come to live amongst us, to teach us, to suffer like us, to suffer with us, 
because he loved us and he committed the ultimate act of love when he sacrificed himself to show the, the greatest act of love in human history. So, but there are many other non-biblical narratives you can uh, use. I'm sure many of you like to read fiction books or you like to uh, watch movies of different kinds. The gospel narrative is replete throughout all different kinds of mediums. And you should be surprised if you think about the gospel through these mediums, how you could use them in your conversation to bridge a gap in the understanding with people. But did you, did you see what happened? When I was telling that story, there's two things, at least two things that storytelling does. It communicates ideas without using sort of this language that people might not be familiar with. A lot of people aren't familiar with the Christian language. Many people aren't really familiar with the word sin. We might think of that as just a normative term, but a lot of people don't quite understand what is sin. And it's the second thing that stories do. You see, while I was telling that story, what I did was I forced each and every one of you to come inside the worldview that I was espousing for a few minutes. I made you sort of disbelieve whatever other things you have and just hear this story and come inside the story of this king who desperately loved and wanted this woman to love him. So for a moment, with narrative, you can get people to come inside a worldview and to see things through your perspective, to see things through a different perspective. This is something that oftentimes logic and reason won't, won't do. So it's something to remember. And finally, you can use actual biblical narratives. I remember when I was at a, an open forum and a young man uh, came up to the microphone to ask a question. And he was talking about how he was so happy with his life. I think he was, he was probably in his later teens. He loves skateboarding and snowboarding and all of these things that my knees no longer allow me to do. And so he was saying, you know, I just don't understand why I even need Christianity. What's, what's the point? I'm happy. Why, why do I need it? And so among, in, in, in many of the answers, it was, it was a panel of us, and he, each of us gave different parts of the answer. And I gave this narrative that Jesus talked about. See, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, he gives this parable. And he, he juxtaposes the case of these two men. He says, there's this wise man and there's this foolish man. This foolish man. You see, the wise man, he built his house on, uh, um, on, on a sturdy foundation, a stone. And then there's this foolish man. You see, he built his house on sort of a shaky foundation of sand. So when all the rain and wind and storms came, whose house do you think fell over? Well, it was the foolish man's house that fell over. And of course, the point of the parable is that our foundations should always be built on something firm. And so for this young man, what I was trying to communicate to him was that, listen, storms will come into your life at some point. This is how life works. Trust me, I'm almost 40 years old. I know. We all have been through different storms. 2020 is one, 2020 is one big tidal wave. So there's all different types of storms that we'll encounter in life. If you don't have a firm foundation, as Hebrew talks about, that uh, uh, the, that uh, the Lord is an anchor for our soul. He anchors us. That is our foundation. If you don't have a firm foundation with which to deal with these storms that will come into your life, you'll be swept to and fro with all the ebbs and flows of life. And there was more to it. But hopefully you see how you can use biblical narratives in conversation uh, with people. And again, Jesus used narratives. He was constantly using parables to convey truth in an accessible and relatable manner. So we talked about sort of the standard apologetic methodologies. We talked about using narrative in our defense and our communication of the Christian faith. And the last one I want to talk about is actually something that Brother Joe right here in the front raised um, with some, uh, some of his comments right at the end of our Q&A in the first session. And that's love. Love as the ultimate apologetic. Listen to the words here of atheist Friedrich Nietzsche. He said, there is something so ambiguous and suggestive about the word love, 
something that speaks to the memory and to hope that even the lowest intelligence and coldest hearts still feel something of a glimmer of this world, of this word. Love, love has a universal appeal because it's a universal need. And apologetics is not only the communication of the Christian faith. It's not just about using words or clever devices or even narrative. Apologetics is also about demonstrating the hope that you all have within you through your actions towards each other uh, as Christians and also to, to non-believers uh, as well. And there's a, uh, an, uh, a British evangelist. His name was Rodney Gypsy Smith. And perhaps you've heard this before. But he talks about the five Gospels. The five Gospels. Now listen. I know you all have a wonderful pastor and teacher and Pastor Jeff. So I know when I said five Gospels, all of you very intelligent Bible learners probably said, what in the world is he talking about? There's only four Gospels. But what Gypsy Smith was talking about was the fact that there's five Gospels. There's Matthew, there's Mark, there's Luke, there's John. And the fifth one is you. Most people won't read the first four, but they will read you. They will read your life. They will, they will read your actions. They will, they will uh, read the way that you, that you talk to people and how you interact with people. How many of you have been to the Detroit Auto Show? Before I know it's been a while since it's been on, so yeah, you have some familiarity with that. I used to love going to the auto show. We would go down there, like like Scott mentioned. I used to work before, not too far away from here, and so I use them as an example. Now, when I would go to the auto show, for example, I would see an ambassador of Ford. Now, this man or woman would be dressed in Ford attire. He or she would speak the the Ford lingo. They would know the pros and cons of of the other vehicles to show the superiority of, uh, of the Ford vehicles. This was an ambassador in every sense of the word. But Paul talks about that if you're a Christian, you're an ambassador of Christ. We should take these words to heart because it really means that, again, in everything that you do, in all of your actions, in the way that you dress, in the things that you say, in the interactions that you have with each other, in your interactions online, on social media, through the things that you retweet, that you repost, that you comment on, that you like, that you dislike, people will see you as being a representative of Christ. So we need to ask ourselves, am I representing Christ like I should in all of my interactions? Am I letting some personal things get in the way of showing love as the ultimate apologetic of Christ. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is John chapter 13, verse 35. Here Jesus says that they, and they is talking about, at that time it was talking about uh, the Jews and Gentiles, but for us it would be anyone outside of the Christian faith. They will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. So you want to defend the faith? Perhaps we need some more internal love, some more internal unity. Because if, I'm, if I can be honest, if I'm a person outside of the faith, a lot of times when they see a lot of the combustible uh, interactions that we have within the church, if I'm them, why would I want to join Christianity? Why would I want to? So we need to think about this. As he said, they will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one Another In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about doing everything uh, so that we can uh, retain the unity in Christ. Now, during the Antonine and Cyprian plagues of the first century, people were trying to escape the ravages, the ravages of these plagues and pandemics. They were fleeing the hilltops and things like that to get away from these things. But historian Rodney Stark talks about the fact that statistically speaking, one was more likely to live, one was more likely to live if they, if they had a Christian as a neighbor. Why? Because a Christian was demonstrating love. They were staying back to care for their neighbors and to do these types of things. 
And this was one of the reasons, also, Stark notes, for the expansion of Christianity. Christianity widely exploded during this time. And guess what? It wasn't philosophical arguments that they used, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, because we should use reasoning. But for this instance, it wasn't that. It wasn't even giving personal narratives or, or, or biblical narratives or, or these things. It was literally being the hands and feet of Christ and showing people the love of Christ. That made them desire, desire to know what, what would make these people in a plague against their own health stay back and care for me and my family. This is how we know what love is. That Jesus laid down his life for us. See, when you love him, this is where you go to seek, to receive, and understand what love truly is. And again, this is why we're called to be Christians, to be salt and light in the world, in our communities, in our workplaces, wherever we're at, wherever we're at inside the world. We are God's earthly representatives. So it's through the prism of our actions that many people will view him. And it's only in Christianity that we find this peculiar answer to many questions. You see, most religions or philosophies or worldviews, they, they offer various arguments of different kinds. But Christianity ultimately offers a person, and that's Jesus Christ. Giving a reason for the hope that is within you can take many different forms. It could take argumentation, not, not bickering, that's not what I mean by argumentation, but I mean reasoning and, and, and engaging in logical discussions with people. It can take that. Defending the, the, the hope that is within you can take the form of giving narratives to people, to, to bring them inside of your worldview or your perspective for a, self, uh, for a second, to help them to see things anew and afresh. But it must always, always be undergirded by a posture and an attitude of love. As Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, so now faith, hope, and love abide. But of these three, but of these three love is the greatest. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your your time. Um, so that's, that'll conclude my, my second talk. Again, I, I really, uh, I really hope uh, if it was recorded, I know it was streamed, but hopefully it was recorded as well. If you could go back and watch the first, the first talk, because again, a lot of things that I talked about there was laying down the biblical foundations. If you're not able to go spend some time in uh, Acts chapter 17, where you see Paul demonstrating apologetics and building a bridge to different cultures and to different people uh, and, and trying to figure out a way, how can I express the hope that is within me to, to Jews and to Gentiles and to these Athenian philosophers, the Stoic and Epicureans? So if you get a time, do that. But now I want to open it up for some Q&A, for some interaction. Uh, we had some great questions, some great uh, comments at the end. So are there any questions, comments? Uh, yes, sir. And if you could, if you could uh, please uh, say your name at the beginning. Hey, I'm Shane. Um, I, I can specify. Shane. I'll repeat the question. Uh, thank you for that question, Shane. And I love that T-shirt. This T-shirt says, "Life is better with friends." True words have never been spoken. Um, yeah. So Shane's question was, he said specifically with my journalism and apologetics background, um, thinking about these things and thinking about our culture at hand. A lot. He's asking me, do I see a lot of uh, or hear a lot of propaganda that could possibly be in the world? I'm, t I'm assuming you mean from like various news outlets and mediums and sort of how how do we navigate these realities um, given my journalism and Christian background? Is that essentially your question? Okay, thank you. So the answer is yes. <laughs> I hear a lot. I hear a lot of Having studied journalism very closely, having done apologetics, or excuse me, uh, journalism, and talked to, to many different people, um, and sort of being on the inside and outside, you hear this phrase, 
fake news, right? You all have heard fake, this, this phrase, fake news, right? That's, like, that's been the catchphrase for the 21st century. And again, I don't care what side of the political spectrum you might be on, okay? We all have heard uh, this phrase of, of, of fake news. Has there been fake news from a journalist perspective? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, how, to, how to decipher that and, and shift through it? As a journalist, one thing that I would have to do is do my due diligence when I was reporting on a specific story to get, to get all the perspectives of the different sides. Because guess what? If I go, again, I dealt specifically with sports journalism. So I, if I go to the winning coach and get all my perspective, I'm going to hear a very skewed perspective of how the game went, unless I went to the perspective also of the, uh, of the opposing coach and got their perspective as well. And then use those things, plus whatever facts in my, per, in, in my own perception of the game, put all those things together and then try to arrive at what's true. See, truth, and you don't need to be a journalist, have a journalist background to do this, but we do have to have, I think, amount of intellectual honesty. Listen, we all have different political affiliations, so we all may be more inclined towards one. But everybody, if we understand the anthropology of Christianity, guess what? Everyone is sinful. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone makes bad choices. And some people lie. <laughs> so we do need to listen to different sides, get different views, try to do our best to um, gather information, and then try to discern uh, what, what is actually true. You know, truth itself can be a hard thing to pin down, but truth corresponds to our uh, truth corresponds to our reality. So, in many times, if you see something, you're hearing something that doesn't correspond to your reality, then you know this this likely cannot be true. And I need to investigate this um, a little bit more. As people who believe in in Christ, and we profess Christ as our Lord and Savior, as I mentioned before. When Paul talks about that we're ambassadors of Christ, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the truth, as he said that he is, I am the way, the truth, and the life, then we should be some of the most people in this world concerned about really arriving at the truth. And we know what non-truths can lead to. Non-truths can lead to dissension. Non-truths can lead to antagonism. Non-truths can, can lead to uh, uh, wrong uh, perceptions and such. So we need to be mostly concerned with uh, acquiring uh, what is what is true. So I hope that that helps uh, a bit, Shane. Here. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is David. Mm -hmm. The question asked us at the end: Where is your Adam? Yeah, thank you uh, for that question, David. And I'll, I'll repeat it again, uh, especially for the on. And I'm sorry I didn't welcome the online folks earlier. I didn't forget about you. Well, I kind of did for a second, but I'm remembering now. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you, uh, online folks, for uh, for tuning in, as well. Um, David's question was. He referenced my first talk. My first talk dealt with um, the value of apologetics and really establishing the biblical foundation. And again, I, I spoke about this, but Acts uh, chapter 17, as a sort of our apologetic example. And at the end of that talk. I ask a question for all of us to reflect on, and that's where is our Athens? And so David's question was, and I'll get into more about what that means for those who, who didn't hear that, hear that talk. But David's question is, as he was thinking about that question, his Athens, or one of his Athens, was at work, where he's engaged people in some of these metaphysical or theological um, uh, issues and he said initially they seemed quite concerned, but after that, there's really no follow-up on their end or, you know, whatever. Is that essentially the essence of, okay. So let me first address what I meant by where's your Athens. So Paul, again, he went to, um, he spoke in, at the Areopagus in Athens, in Acts chapter 17. And he dealt with the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. And he reasoned, uh, with them, showing them that this statue of this unknown God that they had erected 
was actually, and he said that this unknown God, let me tell you about who this God is. And he goes, he goes on between verses 24, I believe, to 27 to give sort of a, a biblical theology treatise and sort of land on, uh, on Jesus Christ. And so for, at the end of that talk, I asked us to consider where was our Athens? Where is the place that we may think that God would have us go to engage with people? to talk to people, to communicate the hope that is within us. Perhaps, like David said, perhaps it's at your workplace. Perhaps it's in, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're playing a sport with someone. It's all different types of, of places, but I would ask everyone to, con to continue to think about where is our Athens? And so specifically, David, to your question, how do you then engage with people who may initially seem interested, but don't, don't really have any follow-up. So I would say, it sort of goes without saying, but of course I'll say it anyway, that oftentimes you can't force people into these conversations. As much as we might see, oh man, this person, if, if, only they, if only they knew the truth, if only they had this bit of knowledge, but sometimes people just aren't ready to hear it, or, they aren't, they are, or their hearts or their ears aren't ready. Perhaps apathy is what's uh, uh, controlling uh, uh, someone's mind or heart. And in those instances, I would say, first, always pray. Stay in prayer no matter what. Tyron here asked a question earlier, too, that had to deal with some people having problems with apologetics because they perceive it to be more focused on philosophy and reasoning these things and these things than focusing on the Holy Spirit. And that was a very important question that he asked. So I would say this first thing, prayer, is, is showing our dependence and our need on God. Pray for this individual. Pray for your interactions with this individual. Secondly, I would say, if you could, it, perhaps you already have somewhat of a work relationship or whatever, continue to try, try and foster a, a relationship with them. I had a, a friend uh, when I was at Thomson Reuters and... Um, and one day I was walking uh, past his desk, and I'm a comic book nerd. I'll tell you that right now. I have like hundreds and thousands of comics. I don't really collect them anymore, uh, but I do have a lot in my basement. And so I noticed that he had a DC uh, T-shirt on. I said, oh, that's a cool, cool T-shirt. And so we struck up a conversation. Next thing you know, we're talking, and we build a relationship. We become friends about three or four months after we had struck up this friendship started to hang out and go to the movies and chat and things like that, he revealed to me that he was an atheist. I had no idea. I did desire to strike up these conversations with him, but I was just trying to find a good entry point, like perhaps you have, David, in some of these conversations. And so he says to me, yeah, Brandon, I'm an atheist. I used to be a Christian, and I fell away from the faith. He said the last thing, this is a true story, he said the last thing, the last prayer that I prayed to God before sort of fully embracing this sort of agnostic, atheistic reality. He said, I pray that God would bring, if Christianity was true, that God would bring a real Christian into my life. He said, a few weeks later, you came to my desk and commented on my DC t-shirt. Now I'll say, this was revelatory to me, because I know just as anybody, I'm as sinful this is any, as, any, as any other person, okay? I do try my best to exemplify Christ in my word and words and deed, but it does show how oftentimes relationships will be the entry point, entry point because what, what, what is it? Um, religion and politics, those are the two things that you don't talk about or the two things that can be uncomfortable to talk about. So sometimes establishing a relationship can help. And thirdly, the last thing I'll say, David, is that Look for opportunities, if you could, to bring things up. The second examples that I gave were, were examples dealing with narrative, personal narrative, biblical narrative, and non-biblical narrative. You'd be surprised at the amount of times where just in conversation, people will be bringing up their favorite movie, or what's going on on the news, or perhaps a book they've read, and you can find short uh, or, or um, sort of implicit entry points, entry points into these conversations about God and about worldview and about the biggest questions of life 
um, that, that really matter. So I hope that's, that's helpful. Um, if not, we can, we can talk a little bit later and go into more detail. But thanks again, David. Any? Oh. Hi, yes. uh, I'm Christian. I'm the two I'm Sorry, Christian's question was regarding modern science, um, there are varying opinions across the Christian spectrum on whether one should or should not embrace um, some of these modern aspects of, of science. Uh, his question to me was, do I think that we should embrace some of these modern, uh, modern sciences? Sure, are they a tool or are they a threat? Are they, are, are they a tool or are they a threat? Okay. Uh, thank you for that, that question, Christian. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, he great talk. See, I, I noticed you even with the mask on. That's how perceptive I am. <laughs> So, um, yeah, he, um, so the question of modern science, now, let me be upfront. I was talking to someone, I think his name was actually David as well. I think he may have left, but I was saying that, you know, there are some, we can't be afraid to say, I don't know about certain things. Science is one of those things that I sort of dip my toe into, but I don't want, I don't, haven't jumped fully in the pool yet because there's a lot of other things I've been studying and spending a lot of time with. That being said, I am familiar with some scientific things, and it's funny that you bring up uh, Ken Ham, He's a, a staunch um, young earth creationist, as I understand. And staunch would probably be somewhat of an understatement <laughs> if you've seen some of his uh, debates and the like. And uh, William Blaine Craig, uh, who's a uh, philosopher and written books like the Reasonable Faith and, and many others. And Christian asks, is it a tool or is it a threat? One of the examples I gave earlier when talking about the standard apologetic methodologies was the cosmological argument. And here, in the second premise, is uh, the premise that uh, the universe began to exist. Well, if I'm using this in conversation with someone, the only way that they're going to say, well, how do we know that the universe began to exist? Well, you can talk about the scientific, um, the scientific evidence, evidence behind it, like the, the red shifts that scientists have talked about, or uh, the, micro, uh, what is it, the microwave, uh, the radioactive microwave uh, 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 features of our universe and, and uh, the fact that in energy is, I don't want to mess it up, but energy is, I think, um, uh, increasing, which shows that at one time uh, it had a starting place. Again, I, I can't say that I know all the specifics of the scientific stuff, but um, some scholars and philosophers that I trust, I've sort of gleaned from their understanding, but you can do some of your own research on this. In ways like this, I think it's definitely a tool because it helps people to move oftentimes from seeing the fact that the universe was actually created. So there's, there's a lot of different philosophies. Um, for example, uh, what's his name? The scientist, uh, I'm, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, the scientist, he was in a wheelchair for the longest. He just passed away. Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins, thank you. Uh, he, had, uh, he, he wrote his last book last book and, and uh, before he died he wrote this book and talked about how uh, he, he posited a lot of different metaphysical theories but these are theories theories anyone can posit a theory the question is the plausibility of that actual theory and the funny thing is at the end of the book he landed on the fact that I don't know and it kind of I don't I don't want to engage in the oversimplification of his of his conclusion here but he sort of landed on the fact that uh, uh, he, he, he really isn't sure and also that uh, it's, it does seem to point in, in one uh, direction, a direction that he, he doesn't ultimately believe. So I do think in our conversations that we can use science as tools to help us. Remember, in many ways, apologetics itself is a tool. Ultimately, we want to get to evangelism. So apologetics is that tool to make our way towards talking about Christ. Now that doesn't mean we have to force Christ in every single conversation where it's this sort of awkward you know, transition, um, but, but we, we should look for opportunities to talk about Christ uh, with individuals that we come across. I think that it can be a hindrance if we rely too heavily on, on science and even someone like a Ken Ham, uh, since you mentioned him, and others who would espouse old earth creationism as the definite uh, scientific perspective of, of Christianity, that can cause unnecessary dissension within the church. 
So whether you're a young earth creationist, whether you're an old earth creationist, those things have no, bear, no, uh, no bearing on the fact that Jesus Christ uh, was raised from the dead. So although these, things that, these are things that we can banter about, we can talk about, and they can have some implications, ultimately they have no overall implications on the veracity of Jesus Christ and the Christian worldview. So I would say use science if you feel so inclined uh, uh, to do so. Just make sure to not use it in a way that, again, causes uh, dissension or is using it in a way. We have to remember, last thing I'll say is this, that the Bible isn't a science book per se. It may contain some, some things that reflect uh, some, some things that we perceive in nature, but primarily the motivation of, of the Bible is not, uh, is not one of science. It's about the revelation the revelation of the fact that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is our King. And, you know, it tells the whole uh, biblical narrative from there. So thanks a lot for your question, you. uh, Christian. Looking forward to uh, more talks from you in the future. Maybe soon. Thanks. Let's thank Brandon for his great job.